Today I'm in Leicestershire to see a car that's got a tax disc in the window saying 1972, which means theoretically it hasn't been outside or on the road in half a century. But what I'm really interested to see is what condition it's in, because this is a British car that came out and was so far ahead of its time and also so expensive. It was fantastic. It was extremely aerodynamic and it was pretty quick. And it's just over there. And the thing I've come to see is in here and we are going to get it out in the sunshine today. So this is a barn fine episode of The Late Break Show and I'm Johnny Smith. So this is David and David this is not your car. No it was my uncle's and now my auntie's. Um, so yeah, my uncle's for 50 odd years now. Um, so he passed away nine years ago. And yes, been in the garage 40 years. No, longer than that. 79 it was moved here. Right, 79, so, right. So, uh, yeah, so it was moved here in 1979 and God. it's not left the garage since. <laughs> oh, gosh, uh, it's been in the garage since the year I was born. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and I like the fact that Dave has turned up in a very cool BMW, which is just part there. A nice E30, which does have a relationship, a distant relationship to the thing in the, in the shed here. Yes, very, very distant, but yeah, certainly lineage there. Yeah. Um, so did you know about this? Obviously this is this car I've, been in here longer than you've been alive. Yeah, um, I've known there was a car in here and that was about it, really. Really? Yeah. So it was never really talked about much. It no. never, clearly never came out. No. To the point where we have to be transparent on the barn funds. I don't like to fake stuff. I said to David, is the garage door going to fall off? Have you actually seen it? To get photos of the car. The door has been painted over however many times over the years to the point where we'll get a close-up of this. All this door handle mechanism has been painted over. So David had to score around the handle to try and open it. The whole mech was seized, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's absolutely no, <laughs> no tiny, sorry. tiny bit of movement in the handle. So you had to so, crawl in through the other side, through the house. Yes, so I've already had to deal with the jungle of cobwebs, um, just to release it from the inside. Yeah. But the door itself, perfectly fine. So we, the door, so the door is free now? Yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. There have been barn finds where I've spent many hours getting the door open. <laughs> so if, if we can, we'll have a look. Is that yeah. all right? Yeah, we can, we can. Oh, Is I've it? got to go and release it. Oh, you've got to go in and release yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. David, are you, are you all right? Yeah, I've made it over the car now. <laughs> you've been straddling. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, I've not fallen off it, so. Cool. In which Ready? case, is the door... Uh, so, right, it's off the latch now. Yeah. So, there okay, you go. cool. Right, yeah, the cladding's. Wow. Look at that. See what I mean about aerodynamics? Look at that thing. It just looks like a, like a computer. Isn't mouse. it still regarded as one of the most aerody aerodynamic? Cars. At the time, because it's the it's the two litre Bristol 403, this was the fastest two litre production car made. Really? Yeah, it did over 100 miles an hour. Yeah. Which at the time, in the 50s, was a big deal. Yeah. Wow. Gosh, it really has been there a while, hasn't it? So what is a Bristol 403? Well, I mean, Bristols are not a very well-known car. Even by, no. even, even car enthusiasts, a lot of them don't know about Bristols. This is actually the second barn fine Bristol I have done, which is bizarre that you contacted me about eight weeks after someone else did about a later Bristol, a 60s Bristol. If you haven't seen that video, I will put a link above my head for that. 
but this was very much the sort of the Bristol which set the standard for technological advancement. So bear in mind, Br Bristol made planes. You know, yeah. they're an aeronautical company. They made planes uh, during the war. And as the war was starting to wind down, or they thought it was, they did think about the fact that there wouldn't be a demand for planes. So they started to think about building cars using the technology and all of the know-how from planes. Hence why all Bristols are aluminium. And it used the Carrozzeria Touring Superleggera system, which is hand-beaten aluminium panels over a steel structure. Um, and this car being the two litre, uh, started as the 401, very similar looking car to the, to the 401, which was the first 100 mile an hour two litre production car. The engine is a straight six, which is borrowed from BMW, perhaps. Not quite after borrowed. The, might have been <laughs> borrowed after the war. And so it's a BMW straight six design with a Hemi head uh, that Fraser Nash took the designs of and manufactured, and that's what these cars were born with, with a Bristol-owned design gearbox. Anyway, am I right in thinking, David, that the engine that we're talking about is there? Yes, unfortunately that is the engine from this car. Crumbs. Okay. Or part of. Part of the engine. Yeah. So the engine the engine has come out of the car for some reason. Yeah, we're not entirely sure why he's taking the engine out. Right. Um, so originally the car came off the road after a small accident. Ah. Which is why there's no bumper and right. So yeah, that's, the that's, the, that's a new bumper. That's a new bumper. So that was bought soon after the accident. Okay, okay. And there was some repair work done to this offside this side, rear wing. Which explains the sort of primer and the... Yeah, so the metal work's been done. Yeah. Um, don't know how well. But and there's yeah. a gearbox down there. So yes, so gearbox, gearbox there, engine block there. there. Yeah. Head somewhere up Heads there. Heads on the shelf, carbs on the shelf some and lower half of the block is in the car right okay. radiator and bits here there and everywhere right. really in there right um, okay this was so one of the first cars to have body colored bumpers i mean we talk about we look at modern stuff now it's it's the norm right yeah but back then it was very much you had chrome bumpers that was part of the design. Bristol though, no, they had quite recessed aero bumpers, deep bumpers, you can see it takes up a lot of the bodywork of the car, and they were they were body coloured. So yeah, and you can see also that someone's added aftermarket indicators, because I think this had trafficators as standard. Yeah, you, and it's also got the indicators on the roof as well. Oh, they've got those on the roof, oh yeah, I yeah. see. Yeah, they're like little, mar they're like marker lights from aeroplanes, which I they, see, which they yeah. might be. Could be, Because yeah. obviously Bristol had pretty Borrowed, rich history. Yeah. Yeah, and but it's things no door handles. No door handles for aero. Just little push buttons to open the doors. So many really quirky, cool features. Yeah, no, no external release for the boot. No, no, or the bonnet. So back then, back then, in terms of like people doing really aero cars, the one, the names that spring to mind for me are very early Saabs, of course Saab made planes, and Tatra, who um, the Czech company who made some really slippery looking vehicles, the Tatra plane. Uh, right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in and have a look at some of these spiders webs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tight fit. It is a tight fit, <laughs> it is. The, uh, so the driver's window's down. Wow. Well, it's dry. Yeah. I mean, that, the car corner, itself seems yeah, that corner of the garage where the poor, the, the bottom end of the engine was, or is, that's been damp, which is a shame, but the, but the car is very, it only just fits in here. Oh, you can see where it's had to chisel a couple of bricks out to get, oh, yeah. get the corner in. Oh yeah. <laughs> Gosh, so it has been squeezed in. Yeah. And he was obviously a bit handy with the tools and stuff. He's got a decent Yeah, range. so. Um, Pete was actually an electrical engineer, yeah. but my granddad was a, I suppose, well, proper, engineer. proper engineer. Yeah. So there's a lot of heavy duty engineering things down there that. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. So the but, so Bristol Motors closed their doors finally in 2020 after 75 years of trading. They started in 45, the year the war ended, where they'd already started 
basic development of what would be the Bristol 401, which looks like this. I think it's an identical shell. Yeah. I think this just has mechanical it, upgrades. Yeah, it has bigger valves, upgrades. it's had a yeah. be better head, it breathed Brakes, a bit more. Brake suspension. Yeah, m more horsepower. I'm gonna, so I can see why you now had to crawl over the car to get to the door, <laughs> because there is simply no room here. Yeah. So I will, I think I'll do the same, and we'll have a look at the front end. Because I, what I like about the front end is going back to the beginning of this video with your BMW E30 outside, probably one of the, the coolest BMW frontal designs, with those little shallow yeah, kidney beams. Yeah, I think that and the sharp noses. That and the sharp noses. This does have a kidney bean front end, despite yep. being a very British car. Not <laughs> as British as you think. There's a lot of Germanic in here. Um, Wow, what a, what a thing. Okay, let's have a look at the front end. I still, do you know what? I can't believe the tires aren't flat. As you can probably see, access is extremely tight. The Bristol is wedged right in. We can't get to the near side at all. Um, David's obviously stood where I've just been. We're gonna clear some of this out so we can get a better look at it, but there it is, look. Those are those kidney bean grills I was telling you about. There is this distant BMW relationship which is a kind of a coincidence because you didn't know about this car, but yet you're into BMWs. Yeah, yeah. How strange. How strange. All comes full circle eventually. Yeah, exactly. And you, you like a bit of straight six engine as well, yeah, don't you? Yeah. You, you, might, you might have quite a strong <laughs> relationship with this straight six because it needs fully rebuilding from what I could see. So we've uncovered as much of the front end as we're going to see while it's in the garage. I am hoping that the brakes aren't seized on on this side because I won't be able to access them. So we'll have to think of an alternative method. This should have drum brakes, this car. Um, disc brakes, which were, I think, Dunlop were optional uh, on, a, on later models, I think the 405. But you, again, you can see how slippery the design is. Uh, the windscreen, the split screens, they're, they're completely flush with the, with the body. Uh, the body was uh, mounted on rubber onto the chassis, which was a, f a real first back then during this era. And um, not much chrome, as I said before, body colour bumpers, little chrome overriders, chrome beauty rings around the lights, and the kidney grills, which are covered in sawdust because someone's been <laughs> using all of these w woodworking tools. I love an old garage with oh, jar jars full of fasteners and really nice old tools. Gosh, that's old. What's that? Mobile. Shock absorber oil. <laughs> Light. Light. These were very comfortable cars. These were, like I said before, these were 100 mile an hour cars, but they were, they were um, notoriously good at cruising at high speed. Mm. Uh, this one obviously is not going to be doing any driving today. But what we do want to do, and I know we talked about it, David, when you, yeah. you contacted the late brake show, was we want to see how well it cleans up. So hopefully what we'll do now is we'll see about, see if the brakes are seized on, what we can unseize, and then get it out in the sunshine and give it a clean. And have a look inside in a bit more detail. But this is the original number. And you've got the registration document, haven't you? Yeah, the original logbook. Which we'll have a look in a sec. Yeah. And uh, what a gorgeous thing. Now, so how many of these were made? You're probably wondering. These were rare, expensive cars, priced only, um, only uh, exceeded by the, the likes of Rolls-Royce and Bentley and Lagonda. Um, I think they only made 200 and... There's... 250? Ideas, yeah, there's sort of ranging values, 231 up to the 270s. Wow. Um, and that's over a two year period. They made the, the, the 403 for two years, 53 to 55. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do now is we'll just see how seized the brakes are. Presu I'm presuming they are. Um, so if you just knock it out of gear and we'll just see if we can roll well, it. The gearbox is over here on the floor, so. Oh yeah. <laughs> so the gearbox. One we don't need course. to do. <laughs> so their engine is not in it and the gearbox is not in it. So I'm going to assume the brakes are seized. Unbelievably, I've just had a look down there and from what I can see, all four tyres are inflated. Which means if it's been in here since 79 when they moved to this house, yeah. the air in the tyres <laughs> is as old as my heart's been beating. Which, 
is amazing. Um, right, so, is Here it going to move at all? The answer to that is no. So we still don't know why the engine came out, but no. we know the engine has been, unfortunately, been sat in the dampest corner of this garage, isn't it? Yeah, so, so the garage wall was pretty much rotted out. Just, oh. it's just touching the, that's it. No, oh, no, I'm on the garage. Are you on the garage? Yeah, yeah, just let me move. Okay, okay. Right, we'll take those Ooh. bricks, I might need those for something else. Those con rods are not pretty. No, there's bits of garage. <laughs> there's rotted garage in, round by the crank, because all of this side, all this corner of the garage is sadly rotted away. Yeah, so what was yeah. Uncle Pete gonna do? Well, the idea was um, part restoration. Yeah for whatever it needed. After it had the accident? Yeah, so I fixed the accident damage and then... And did he the have time. the accident? Yes. That was when he owned the car? Yeah, so I think he probably had it on the road less than a year. So yeah, it was a bit of a hit and run by all accounts. That was a hit and run? Yeah, so um, coming back from a Sunday lunch, um, Pete and Rosemary, my auntie and uncle, um, Dark country lane, 1970s headlights. <laughs> <laughs> Probably six volt, I'm sure it'd be six volt. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, car coming the other way, uh, across the road, or across the centre of the road and clipped the back of it. And, and carried on? Yeah. So we never so, know who hit the car or what it was? No. So it's not been through insurance. How annoying. So, yeah. But I mean, so the repair gonna... looks pretty good. I mean, it does, obviously, yeah. aluminium car, quite a specialist repair. But yeah. right, if you get that out of the way, and I'm glad to see there is. We might need this. If we're going to tow, tow the car out, we might need that. Let's get the bumper off the roof. Amongst a collection of sawdust. God, that's so and light. Cobwebs. <laughs> This be aluminium? That is aluminium. Well, it's damn light, so I presume it must be. Yeah, it doesn't weigh anything, yeah. does it? Yeah, it doesn't weigh anything. Yeah, that's really light. So that's never been on a car? No. New old stock Bristol. I'm presuming these bits that I'm about to carry out now are to do with this rear end, or this spare wheel well area. I'd say a bulkhead transmission tunnel uh, could, type shape. Could be, couldn't it? Yeah, actually you are right. Pedals, I reckon, reckon it is a bulkhead. Stone column. Yeah, or the master cylinder. It's gonna see if I can get myself. So that's a gearbox you wanted me to take out of gear for you. This this is the gearbox <laughs> that you that I need to be out of gear, please. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so that's the box. Bristol made their own gearbox, I believe. That looks in a lot better condition than the, uh, the bottom end of the engine was. This box uh, is what I think to be the transmission tunnel. So all the bits that Uncle Pete took off to get the engine and gearbox out, at least has all been put methodically away and stored well. And I reckon these are very hard to find pieces of bumper trim, the bright work that goes into the body color bumpers. They're either new, or they've got some very old newspaper, or they're the originals being reused. So this stuff needs to go somewhere safe. I don't want to speak too soon, but we've managed to unseize both the back wheels with a bit of WD and just gradually knocking it with a rubber mallet. So the back wheels, which were seized quite hard, are free. We've put the wheels back on, we're going to drop it off the jack. Uh, David's got the exhaust out. I've just jacked up this front corner and it spins freely. 
So three of the four wheels we know are free. Hallelujah. We're now going to drop it off the jack and we'll see if it pushes using human power. And if it does, great, we'll get it out here. If it doesn't, we'll probably pull it with the straps that are already attached that have been there since 1979. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong using my electric car? And if that front corner is seized, it'll hopefully just free off. So that's the plan. Hallelujah. Sun shining. Straight in her face. The Bristol, yeah, I've, I've inhaled a lot of dust since we, yes. every time the wind blows, I'm inhaling more dust. So, but it's fantastic to see it out. Bodily, it looks really straight, actually. Yeah. The rot that I've seen is quite minor on the leading edges of the chassis at the back. Yeah, both sides, it just looks like surface. And yeah, it it's, it's pretty minor, all things told. The cabin is our next um, place. We're going to just pull out the parts of the engine that have been left on the back seat, fold the seats back up and just see what the condition of the leather is. It's like a lovely kind of dark, deep red. Yeah. I think there's some floor panels out as well. Yeah. So maybe see if we can find those. Yeah. And we'll do that. And you've got some, some, some documents, I know, with the car. Yes. So we've got the original logbook. Um, so that sh shows Peter's the second owner. The second owner? Second owner, yeah. That's cool. And we've found one MOT certificate, okay. which would be the last one yeah. it had. Wow. So, and I think from memory, it's around 20,000 miles. Really? I think so, yeah. Okay. Double check. That's, I think not, that's, that's not many. That's nothing. That is nothing at all. I was going to ask you to that end, what is the plan for this car? Is it staying with you guys. I I'm hoping I can maybe get it back on the road myself yeah um because you're fairly hands-on aren't you your BMW yeah you've done a fair amount of around with a lot of E30 BMWs Mark 1 Mark 2 Golfs yeah um yeah I think that engine might be a bit beyond it see look at look at this so all the controls are quite flush that look that plunger button to open the door the it still works and this so smooth and just completely flush button it's just another quirk of the bristol drawing from its roots of being in the aviation industry the steering wheel was a nod to aviation as well with the yes. two that's right like, two the, like the bat wing kind of controller yeah. yeah it's great yeah now either this is there's a bit of a question mark here Either, That's a rodent nest. Either it's a rodent nest or it's just lots of sawdust. I hope it's sawdust. All aluminium? Yeah, all aluminium. So that's probably just fine. And that back seat actually looks quite good. Yeah. Hmm. So there's the back seat and you can see Interesting proportions, this car. Hardly any quarter panel before you go into this big sweeping arch. This is the one that's had the accident damage from the hit and run driver in the 70s. Yeah. Um, the leather's not looking bad at all and the armrests look, look really good. Pop out rear windows. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn the driver and passenger seat around and see what they're like. I'll pass that to you. So it's wooden framed. Wooden framed, yeah, really thick wood too. But what are they like? Moment of truth. Uh, they're not great. Well, that's mould or that's old chipboard. <laughs> the chipboard to protect. And that's mould as well. 
And and you noticed, Matt, the cameraman, look, the maker's, maker's plate down there, look. I think that's the um, dealer, the original selling dealer. Anthony Crook. Yeah. So the information from the Bristol Owners Club shows that as where the car was delivered, you know. Right. Anthony Crook. And I'm pretty sure Tony Crook ended up buying Bristol in the 60s when it was failing. Okay. And then took it on to its sort of next phase of life. So the quirkiness continues inside. Now, I don't know if this is the original audio system, but there's a lovely radio there with these speakers down in the A pillars and these roller blinds instead of um, sun visors. Can you see that? That's wonderful. So yeah, carpets have completely had it. Um, and that piece of chipboard there is not original. I think that's just been resting there to put the interior in, but the car is complete look at these gauges this is probably one of my favorite parts of the car look at the art deco font the rpm uh, the tacos over there on the passenger side clock ammeter water and oil temps or pressure all these lovely smith's gauges they're quartic in shape so if you're wondering where the rest of the bristle engine is now that we've got the car out we can see this shelf here has got pretty much the rest of the top end of the engine and the ancillary so we've got the air filter here the air intake the head which is a hemi head as we know bmw design then manufactured by fraser nash that's the tri triple carburetor set up here with a linkage fuel pump valves valve springs dynamo starter motor distributor gear stick it's all here so this is the paperwork then? Yep, so this is what um, has been found in the bedside table. The old so, logbook. I love these old green buff books. So registration, and it says, you said it, the colour's been crossed yeah, out from yeah. blue and maroon's been written on the side. Yeah, different These were all pen. handwritten back then. Yeah, type of body, petrol, 403, yep, yep, yep. And what was that? The date of original registration. registration, 5th of March, 1954. And it changed hands in 71, is that? Yeah, uh, 13th of October, 71. Yeah, and the tax expired at the beginning of 72. Wow. So that was a four month tax disc as well. Did you four. notice that? Yeah. And I saw so the, on, so the cost of tax, it did say, was it on this piece of paper um, or on the other one? Yeah, there. Yeah. Four months, nine pounds 15. 12 months of tax, 25 quid. <laughs> wow. They were the days. Nine pounds 15. So yeah, and he was, Pete was the second owner. The second, second owner. owner. Yep. Where it's from? From Hampshire. Hans, yeah. That's never been on a car, has it? Ever. Brand new. So we must have joined the club in the 70s. I think so, yeah. Or the 80s. And uh, that looks like the last MOT certificate. So all this paperwork looks like it's what you would have carried with you in the glove box. Yeah. Um, yeah, proof of ownership, roadworthiness. Yeah. So yeah, just date of issue, 19, December 1970. Date of expiry, December 71. Yeah. Mileage. Oh, where's the mileage? Where's the mileage? Oh, no. 19,919. Have you had a look at the mileage inside? No. 26,485. 26,000 miles. He got, he got a move on, didn't he? <laughs> well, he probably thought, I'm going to make the most of this. Yeah. bought myself a prison. So you think this is 26,000 miles from new car? Yeah. Wow. Well, if that's the case, what on earth happened to the engine? <laughs> was Uncle Pete a bit handy behind the wheel? Was he a bit of a fast driver? Yeah. Maybe he wanted a bit more out of it. Maybe he did. Maybe he gave it a good hiding. So, then what's that there? So, handwritten receipt from Brian May. Brian May. Not, not, not that guy. Not, not no. him. <laughs> no. So not Queen Guitarist, so yeah, 18th of September 1971. Enclosed is the logbook for the Bristol. Oh great, okay. 
So yeah, that was it. So Brian May, from memory, is it was he's passed away now, hasn't he? Yeah, was a so. massive authority on Bristol. In fact, he's probably the Bristol guy in Britain, in the world. Yeah, I mean, I don't know a lot about him, but I've come across information on forums mention his name. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he's from sure Birmingham, so it seems like it's the same guy. Right. Interesting. So, and then there's just some insurance just documents. Insurance document. And what's that one? Oh, and this is just the information I got from the owners' club. So the information they've got from Bristol. So just the chassis numbers, registration. Yeah, Anthony Crook Motors, which. Yeah. So that looks like it's the specification. Yeah. And where it was supplied to. So yep. yeah, that matches with. Right hand drive car number. 403-1-881 Yeah, March 1954 mm. Now it's no surprise there's no engine and gearbox or anything in here because <laughs> it's all on the shelves or on the floor there but you know we were talking earlier about the way in which these Bristols are constructed the super leggera idea well you can see it on the inside of the bonnet metal steel um, kind of bird cage frame overlaid by aluminium hand-beaten skin. That was the premise for the whole car. Uh, and this was a very early example of it, the 400 series Bristol. Um, other cars followed like Aston Martin, but these guys were doing it first. So although it's a big car, and it is a big car this, even by today's standards, it's a big car, especially for a two-door. It's not that heavy. And it's all there. We were looking inside, linkage, wiring loom, it's all been dismantled and put methodically into boxes. It's not like you've got to like search for where it all is. It's got rack and pinion steering. Yeah. Didn't notice that. Look at that. Not bad for a 50s. No steering boxes, eh? No, no steering boxes. That is all right, that is. I can see your brain is going, <laughs> how do I get this back on the road as quickly as possible? I would say, get that looked at. Uh, the feasibility of that bottom yeah. end going again. That's, yeah, that's the big I'll, question mark, isn't it? From that. The rest of the car looks pretty good yeah talking of which let's move the upholstery to one side and we'll get the pressure washer out Okay, so it looks a bit different how it did this morning. Yep, uh, transformation. And I know you were itching to get the snow foam out. Yeah, as soon as I saw it on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't cope with the uh, cobwebs and dust. I love it. I have to say, I know that we couldn't get the car running clearly when the engine's in pieces next to it. But what a lovely backstory. It's not been outside for 45 years. Um, and the great thing for me is, A, extremely rare car, but B, yeah. hopefully it's going to stay in the family and I think you're going to crack on and try and... Going to try. See yeah. if we can get that engine rebuilt and checked and channel all your BMW restoration skills into getting this thing back on the road. Maybe as a patinated Yes, car it's, uh, we we'll use. keep the character. I think yeah. you should. I think you should. I, I, think, I think it works. Yeah. I hope you've yeah. enjoyed this episode of The Late Break Show. Maybe you know of a car that's in a hedge, in a garage, in a real barn, on someone's drive that could be of interest. Let me know. There's an email address in the description below. Thanks for watching.